Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. Today's guest is poet Eugenia Fain. So sit back. Pop a cold one. And dive into some books. And brews. We're all good to go. Uh, welcome, everybody, out there to episode 26 of the Books and Brews podcast. How are you doing, Laura? Well, in theory, this, or I mean, in reality, it's actually episode 36. If you take into account our our days way back when at AM 950, and then our uh, that traumatic uh, few months that you had at Barnes & Noble. <laughs> 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 the Barnes Michael, and Noble period. Michael's like, don't remind me. I'd almost wiped it out. <laughs> this is <laughs> <years> every month. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my month's been good. I, I have uh, been traveling. I don't know if I mentioned last month, but on our way home from Florida in uh, what was that, March? Yeah, March, we bought an RV. And so I drove a 32 foot RV for the first time in my life. Wow. I was terrified. I was pretty sure. <laughs> um, actually, I don't know if I said it last month, but we took it out of Nashville through heavy Nashville traffic with a car towed on the back in addition. So this thing was like, I don't know, 42, 46 feet long, something like that in heavy Nashville rush hour traffic. Neither of us had ever driven it something that big before. So that, that was really scary. This was a lot better. But um, it doesn't sound like a good idea. Somehow. I, I really thought it wasn't. <laughs> and yet I live to tell the tales. So, you know, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. But um, it, it's been a really fun month. I just got back from Missouri. We took it down there. Uh, another one of my sons graduated from the military. So wow. his graduation and he can now drive things like bigger than my house. <laughs> and, you should have had him driving the RV. Well, you know what? <laughs> Um, my husband wanted him to he's like oh I have a driver on the way back because I don't want to drive that thing and I said no he can drive these massive earth moving pieces of equipment but he doesn't drive them at 75 miles an hour down the highway with the semi next to him. <laughs> so it's it's still quite different but um we had a little ghostly incident down there and um wow. to an antique shop and we found what was, I was told it was a German Bible that was like 50 years old. It turned out to actually be Norwegian and it wasn't a Bible. It's a collection of sermons and it's actually 200 years old. Wow. Uh, it's full of all these um, names of people who owned it and mm-hmm. postcards that they stuck in there. And it's, it's really interesting. So we've kind of been following the family history a little bit and seeing what we can find out about these people who owned it. So that's wow. Yeah. How's your banjo going? Uh, banjo is great. Um, uh-huh. I discovered that I can take the resonator off the back of my banjo uh, to make it an open back instead of a closed back banjo. Uh, I- and it is significantly oh. quieter. <laughs> oh, very cool. It okay. sounds kind of more old timey than bluegrass, which I like. Are you going to start getting out and jamming with people? Oh, no, I'm nearly, no, nowhere near that far. <laughs> But you should uh, try it. It's, uh, I, I think you would find that people of all levels are going out and playing. Like you could go to open mics. I mean, yeah, I like those are fun. I can, play, I can play five songs and I can play them the way that I learned them, but I can't do much beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> Bit by bed. <laughs> have, have uh, I, did take a, I did take a road trip. Oh, you did. Uh, when I took a 12 day road trip, it was great. We had five days hiking in Utah because uh, I didn't get to go last year. Mm-hmm. Get my Utah fix in. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we went to Gallup, New Mexico, visited a friend of Masako's, and then uh, had a spa day in Santa Fe. Nice. Uh, and then stopped oh. in far western Kansas, uh, <laughs> visit a couple of. Uh, to visit an uncle uh, and visit the my family's old family farm. Oh, um, oh wow! We summited Mount Sunflower, the highest point in Kansas. 
um, which is an inconspicuous rise in the middle of a cow pasture. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the highest point is not all that high. <laughs> well, it is high actually. It's 4,093 okay. feet. Um, mm -hmm. But in in comparison to the surroundings, <laughs> okay. it doesn't really stand out much. As we were driving up to it, Masako said, I don't see a mountain. And I said, <laughs> yes, you do. It's right there. <laughs> there it is. Well, you know, that's interesting. So you and I were both on Route 66 this month. Yeah. Because I found out where we stayed in Waynesville, uh, I wanted to say Indiana, Waynesville, Missouri is right on Route 66. So I got a picture of myself in front of this humongous, like 15 foot Route 66 sign. And cool. we route, route 66 mugs and my kids reminded me that I inflicted the song on them the entire way to San Diego for my other son's graduation a few years. Oh. I was like, yes, good memories. And they're like, no, <laughs> bad memories. Yeah. This is the greatest song ever. How could you not play Route 66 when you're on Route 66? <laughs> so did, did you read some books this month? I read one. Um, I, I am doing work research again. Okay. Uh, so I read a book called Life is Not Binary. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really fascinating. So it looks at uh, non-binary, not just in terms of gender, but in terms of other kinds of like non-binariness in relationships, uh, non-binariness in uh, nature, um, just sort of, you know, pointing out that uh, non-binary is the norm mm -hmm. and if imposed the binary onto that norm. Interesting. Well, my book was totally different. I, I actually read fiction this month, which was kind of exciting. I read, um, do you know who Lorna Landvik is? No. She is a Minnesota author. And so a long time ago, I had found one of her books and all the people in my writer's group were going on about how great she was. So I kind of felt like I should read her. And um, this book has been sitting around for, I don't know, five years or something. And so my rule is I'm allowed to read for enjoyment if I'm on the treadmill. So I walk on my treadmill reading. And um, so it's called The View from, or I think it's just called Mount Joy. It might be called The View from Mount Joy. And it, it was an interesting book. You know, there were some things I really liked about it. It takes us through this guy's life from the time he's 17 till he's in his 50s and his kids are growing up and, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting story and the basic kind of theme of it is that life is not going to be what you expect, but sometimes you end up being very happy with what you got. And, and I really think it's, it's a lot about attitude, you know, we're going to be happy if we have the right attitude rather than if we get what we think we want. So it was a good book. Yeah. Who's our guest today? Well, today we have with us a poet, and we, we seem to kind of go in streaks where I think we had people from Europe in a row, at least we were supposed to, I, I think she disappeared on us, um, and the next two months we'll have two poets in a row, so today we have Eugenia Fain, and I assume I pronounced that correctly? That's correct, you're right. Yeah, I mean, it looks like an easy name, but sometimes <laughs> you know, it's it's not actually pronounced like it looks. Well, we've been we've equated people, before, so you remember me. We've yeah, had that's people from, We've had people from all over the place lately. Eugenia, where are you? I am in Columbia, South Carolina. I, right. um, I was born in Charleston, and I heard you talk about your travels. And we, My husband and I haven't been to Charleston in a bit, but one good thing about the Charleston is it's like New Orleans. They have the beautiful carriage tours. And they have ghost stories and lots of ghost tours. Oh, wow. I haven't read any ghost stories since I since I was a child in school. Uh -huh. But um, what else? There lots of beautiful plantations, gardens, uh, beaches. Just just a beautiful, quaint town. Lots of history. Yeah, can I say I, I have Columbia, South Carolina? You said I'm in Columbia right now. That's two hours yep. from where I was born in Charleston. I have very fond memories of Columbia, South Carolina. So. Really. I, I run a theater company and we toured to college campuses doing interactive issue-based shows. And for, gosh, maybe 15, 16 years in a row, we went every fall to Columbia College. Oh, nice. Uh, and the women at Columbia College are still my favorite audience anywhere to perform for. 
Oh, wow. Unfortunately, you said Columbia no College? Enrollment. Columbia College, yeah. Okay, I have, I know where that is. Yep. Unfortunately, their enrollment dropped significantly, and we haven't been back there in, I don't know, five years or more, but uh, I still hold Columbia College dearly <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> well, you know, I have, uh, my husband and I have an older friend. My parents have passed away. But my my uh, my father was a military veteran and a war veteran. He's buried in the Beaufort National Memorial with honors. But um, I have a my husband. And I have an older friend in the nursing on a nursing home here, and she said, oddly enough, just to, just a minute more to make some small talk, that Columbia College and the girls came by and did a senior prom for them. So she was so proud. Excellent. Uh -huh. um, you're Laura, I'm sorry, I interrupted you reading the introduction, so go ahead. <laughs> hey, this is a fun conversation. Uh, I just want to make sure we tell our, uh, you know, 45 million listeners who we're talking about. <laughs> Payne is an author of poetry and prose. She is also a songwriter available on Amazon and Spotify. She has 40 years of experience in writing. She is a preschool teacher, tutor, and international author, published during the Eugenia is featured in several anthologies and published online in print, ebook, and audiobook form. She has no children and resides in Columbia, South Carolina with her husband, Ivan, and Tabby Cat Buddy. But I think you just said you're in Charleston now, right? No, I'm in Columbia. I grew up in Charleston. I, I started to get uh, our discussion mixed up. And That's okay. <laughs> so what's our first beer, Michael? Our first beer uh, is from Fry's Brewing in Minneapolis. Uh, it is a, I, it is a pale ale. You're going to hate this one, Laura. It's a pale <laughs> ale uh, made with citra hops called Course Correct. Um, the reason I chose this to go with this first poem is that this first poem is kind of a, it, as I read it, is kind of a reflection on life's journey. Uh, and the many opportunities to co course correct, to change course, to think about, you know, this is what I was doing then, and then I changed. And this is, these, I got in these relationships, and then I changed. Um, so I just thought the name of the beer was appropriate for this poem, course correct. So, Laura, you're not going to drink that out of a can, are you? Oh, goodness, no, <laughs> far more class than that. <laughs> so um, since you promised me I'm going to hate it, I only pour it a little bit. All right, cheers. We'll see, yeah. Yeah, it's not my favorite. <laughs> yeah, didn't think it would be. You don't like the hops. <laughs> well, it's, there's, there's a term I've heard, uh, I Anyway, I won't repeat the term I've heard for beer that tastes like what I think this tastes like. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, cheers, I guess. Yep. You go ahead and read your first poem. Okay, I'm glad we're ready. Cheers to you too. Okay. Um, let's see. Immortality. This is a poem called a gloss poem. Let's make certain we can see me. And I like experimenting with different things old and new, something borrowed, something blue, just like for a wedding or just like you might throw together all the ingredients that you have in the cupboard to make a, a little soup and just with leftovers and odds and ends. I often use inspiration from poets like Robert Frost and Dunbar and Langston Hughes and Shakespeare, Langston Hughes, just from all over the place, as I remember. And this gloss poem, by definition, is a poem that takes four lines from a famous poem and uses the, each of those lines as the last line of each stanza. So what I used was Emily Dickinson's Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Okay, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but, but our sails propelling forward more and more. I'm sorry. Oh, oh my. Okay, there was a time, on, I, I actually don't have all this point, so I missed it, but and there was a time on my journey when I thought only of myself. I lived in riotous, living abroad, squandering the time I had in the world. Far from home and the distant land, I sought to make my fortunes and to pitch my nomadic tent, always remembering the home I left as I tried to disguise the pain because I could not stop for death. 
They were strangers that I met. I endeavored to call every man a friend. Some had success and others defeat, so many of them just like me. I surgered in the land of dreams, dancing to the drummer's beat. I did emit a mournful cry as the memories flooded back. I begged the rhythm to stop at once. He kindly stopped for me. Okay. I said I missed it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to recommend that you go online as I have piqued your interest and that you finish that poem at allpoetry.com. My sign on is my wife 304. And if you go to allpoetry.com, where Kevin Watt is the editor, as the editor, that you can finish that uh, glows poem for me. But it's it's really one of my favorite. So uh, you. Oh, here, well, no, actually, okay, I do. Can I do. As I went along my way, I find some. I found love in the strangest places. Taking a lover by the hand, I tried to resume a dance. It helped me to have company as I traveled my lonesome path. The choices set before me, there was a solace come at last. We traveled bravely toward the dawn, the carriage held but by ourselves. Though we fought like wildcats, we were often overcome with fright. Living as best we knew how, the devils our souls did, and our souls arose. Then with fretful hearts, we drove through our destination shore, propelling forward more and more. But, you know, go ahead and look it up on uh, allpoetry.com as well as the and others. I, I actually went here. Well, as you know, I think we're, we're connected on all poetry at this point. And I, I think you know which one is me, right? Mm-hmm. Poetry. Um, I think you've got what, like 530 poems up there? I do. I do. I've got <laughs> a textbook full of poems. <laughs> prolific. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. And I can't believe it slipped. I just looked him up the other day. He was a, a friend of mine or, you know, I mean, for what that word is worth on, on social media. But he was absolutely prolific. He had, I don't know, 1,500 poems or something there. And I had actually set one of his poems called The Reaper Man to Music. Oh. And, and so I went back to get his permission to, uh, you know, play this on piano with the words. Mm-hmm. I found out he passed away a couple of years, which tells you how long it's been since I had been on there. But um, it was really neat to just see the outpouring of love for him. And I found his obituary online and all these people from all poetry were there leaving comments. So it's it's a really neat place to connect with other poets and, and make friends. Um, so uh, one of my questions had actually been for you to define a gloss. Is it pronounced gloss? I think you said. Gloss, G-L-O-S-E. Um, and you did that before I even asked. But do you know the history of this form? I do not. That's something you can Google. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't always write down what's, what country the form originates in. But usually when I publish, I'll put the form of poem. But I don't, you know, I don't tell you anything about how to write it or where it originates. But if you would like to study it or do one yourself, you can Google it. And one of my favorite editors is Robert Lee Brewster, B-R-E-W-S-T-E-R. He has a wealth of information on poetic forms. If you just well, Google I, that. I did look up the, the various forms that you listed and see, I, I didn't write it down in my notes. Um, I, I have a terrible short-term memory, like <laughs> early write down. What did you do this month? <laughs> I don't know. It's been a busy month. I might forget if I don't write it down, but um, I think the gloss is the one that is uh, medieval Spanish form. So, but I'm going by memory. It's possible. It's one of the others, but I think it is. That it, sounds about right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I found that really interesting that even that long ago, they were, you know, creating so many different forms and they were doing this, this idea of borrowing, except really it shouldn't um, surprise me. I mean, you're, you're also a musician. So, you know, a lot of times it seems to go together, music and poetry. And in right. music, there was a similar thing that back in medieval times, Nobody thought anything of taking somebody else's melody and they use it as their baseline and build a new melody over it. Right. You know, we would go like, oh, my gosh, that's plagiarism. You know, you're, you're stealing someone else's work. But to them, it was just how it's done. I, th that's always done. And I know in music, a lot of times that the, the, the performers will borrow you know, something and use some lines from another famous song. So, you know, they're just all sorts of things that that I enjoy. And I just had it before I talked to you guys, I just had a inspiration for a new song. So wish me luck and hope that it works out and I can, 
I can get it maybe some some play and some attention. I, I was curious with this form, you know, do you start with an idea of what you want to say and then you go find, say, Emily Dickinson's poem that will work? Or do you pick a poem you like? And then No, I, 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 I think um, I just think of, you know, something that I would like to work with. Um, sometimes I'll just go on a site and find famous poems or <laughs> Google, uh, say, poems about death or poems about friendship. Mm -hmm. And and just go through that, you know, there's sites with like 100 famous poets or something like that. So it, it usually works out pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. I just pick something that I like and zero in on a verse that I think it would be, you know, the verse or the lines that I like to recreate into something new. And I just go from there. And you, you work in a lot of forms, you know, as I looked at some of your various um, interviews or writings or bios online, you work with quite a lot of historical forms and forms around the world. And I'd say today, freeform is kind of much more popular. What is it that appeals to you about working in forms specifically? Just more creativity, just expanding my craft and, 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 and getting those 530 poems. I actually have five more than 530. I have some lost poems. <laughs> we talked about the lost years and the apocrypha has been lost for some time and discovered. But I have um, some other poems that I started off with. Um, was, was, was an earlier publisher and, and that, I, that went back to Thailand and published me. And not all of those are immortalized online. I started with Kevin Watts community and all poetry a few years ago. And so okay. that's what I have really amassed in the last years. But I have maybe a um, hundred poems that, that I have not immortalized online because I don't have them anymore. They're, you know, they're in the library at my schools, but I didn't, um, I didn't catalog them for online, but you know, it's okay. I have enough online. <laughs> so, as I think about your question, Laura, it's like, for me, imposing a structure Mm -hmm. uh, helps my creativity. You know, I find that it gives really me boundaries, gives me limits that I have to find ways to work with them. Right. I find it really interesting that both of you say that. And I, I think so too. I, I love working in forms, but I think a lot of people today feel the opposite that they're being constricted in a box mm -hmm. and they feel it hinders their creativity. But one of the things that I read years ago about the, the early poets working in free form was that the reason they were so good at it was exactly because they had spent so much time working within boundaries, within rules, that they really had to find ways to deal with so many things. They had to find creative vocabulary images. Um, they had to think about rhythm and flow and all these things. So I think those early uh, poets of free form would agree with you, but I think a lot of people don't see that today. Well, yeah, I, I do free form. I do all sorts of poems. You know, some of them may not be as as mature to the credits mm -hmm. as others, but but I um um you know I have over a hundred solid poem forms, and there <laughs> there's more than that. So um some of them I couldn't figure out very readily. They were more challenging, but but, you know, Brewster lists about 168. That's the most I found. There may be more, but Brewster research. Like that. Yeah. And I have at least 100. <laughs> Some well on the way. Interesting and really challenging. But, no, I, I agree, too, that free form absolutely can be done very well. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I wish that people would work both ways, you know, because both have their benefits. But I think forms are not as highly regarded today as Maybe I think they should. Be. <laughs> um, you know, one, one last question. Unless I mixed up the many things I was reading, you were published when you were 11 in right. mythology. How in the world did that come to happen? Through the mail. I don't know. I don't know how. I got a lot of great opportunities in the mail. Mm -hmm. uh, now they're coming through email and I'm just kind of networking with great people like you guys. And um, they give me ideas and workshops and markets where I can where my poetry can be heard and magazine editors that might like to uh you know get some work submitted for anthology so 
but this just came in the postal mail way back when. And they just asked me to, I don't know why they picked me, but they just asked me to, to contribute. So I just had a little childlike poem Mm -hmm. and um, they picked it and they put my picture in and my little biography next to you and (laughs) your colleagues. And I guess I was the youngest person there. I looked like a little little uh-huh. pygmy and a little I mean I, I didn't even look 11 I looked like a little six-year-old I was so small <laughs> but um about lending beauty to the world it was just a poem just a simple right. little childlike poem about nature the birds and the trees and mm-hmm. and how God created that and how they you know beautify the world so mm-hmm. they were had, good enough to choose me had you been like sending off for things related to poetry or this just kind of randomly came I don't I don't know I can't, I don't, I don't know why they, why they, um, how they singled me out or, you know, what opportunity it was. I haven't written every year since then. I -hmm. like, um, I'm always writing postcards, letters, emails, greeting cards, you know, so I I like to write and edit and review for others also, but Mm -hmm. I haven't written every day of my life. You know, I, um, there, there are so many forms of writing, like I said, with the letters and the to-do list and the grocery list and that type of thing. Sure. But I haven't. Oh, we just lost the sound. We just lost your sound. Um, well, we figured that out. I want to mention, uh, I had from, I believe from all poetry, I had taken down one of your poems called I Am No Prophet, which is another ghost poem. And I highly recommend that anybody go uh, read that. It's called I'm No Prophet. It's a ghost poem that's based on the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And Michael, I think we are ready for beer number two. All right. Uh, Beer number two uh, is called Dark Truth Imperial Stout. It is from Boulevard Brewing Company in Kansas City. Uh, It is a big, rich, Imperial Stout, um, almost 10% alcohol. It's got nice coffee, uh, bitter chocolate and licorice notes and some citrus and pine resin hops that come in there as well. Uh, I chose this beer because this this second poem, it's a dark poem. Um, And so I wanted something that was big and sort of pitch black uh, dark, and I also thought that the name for this one was appropriate, Dark Truth, because the poem seems to express a dark truth. Um, Laura, you might like this one. It's kind of bitter. You, but... you see, I pour it a lot. Yeah, <laughs> you might not <laughs> like this one. I don't know. <laughs> now I'm stuck with it, right? Cheers. Cheers. See my uh, frothy mustache there. <laughs> I do like this. Okay, good. I wasn't I, I sure because it, it's pretty bitter, so I wasn't sure if you were going to like it or not. I, I do. I, I would definitely buy this again. In fact, uh, way back when we bought, uh, I don't know, a couple boxes or a case or whatever of that Manhattan Social that we oh, did wow. back in January. And um, I'd sort of forgotten about that, but I was enjoying that for a while, like even apart from books and brews. Nice. So, um, Eugenia, you are muted. And Michael, were you going to talk about the beer? Uh, I did. You did. <laughs> I said what I had to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't say a whole lot about it. But we are ready for poem number two. Uh, I'm. Just, yeah, we still don't have your audio for some reason. Yeah. I tell you what, I'm going to call you and just read it over the phone. Yeah, we're gonna get it. Yep. Okay. Should I take out my headphones and use a phone? Uh, yeah, because for some reason you're not coming through. Okay. Well, I'm glad you had a backup plan. I always. I have nine kids. I've got backup plans upon backup plans. <laughs> Big family. Okay. A song of despair. A viator point. Sing a song of despair. A party campaign. Let it ring forth through the rolling hills. People will hear, sing a song of despair. Many will join in with their own lament. Beat the solemn drums and march into the assembly. Sing a song of despair. Let the cadence roar. That was short and sweet. (laughs) 
<laughs> that was kind of like your description of the beer. Wait, we're done. <laughs> so in, in my writers group, we always, uh, Ross, always had the poets read twice. And um, go ahead and read through it one more time. Oh, okay. And it was short and sweet, so let's repeat it. A song of despair, a viator poem. Sing a song of despair of hearty campaign. Let it ring through the rolling hills. People will hear, sing a song of despair. Many will join in with their own lament. Beat the song drums and march into the assembly. Sing a song of despair. Let the cadence roar. I like that one a lot. Um, you call this a Viator poem. Can you define for our uh, 45.08 listeners what that is? You notice we just went up. No, but I can try and I can try and leave you on speakerphone and do a search for it. Like I said, I don't, you know, I just read the instructions and I don't write the instructions down or remember them. I just, oh, okay. you know, I just I just take the instructions from the editor and um and do a notation of what what it is. But let's look it up. We can do a search. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Michael, can you hear her fine? I can hear her fine. Here it is. Okay. Poet forms. It says the Viator is a poetic form invented by Robin Skelton, author of The Shapes of Our Singing. You want me to go over the rules for you or just um, yeah, go, go over the rules for our readers, I mean our listeners. The first line is a refrain. The set, refrain appears in the second line of the second stanza, the third line of the third stanza, and the final line of the final stanza being the refrain. Um, so when I was doing this sort of personal study, working through forms and trying them all out and so on, I came across the form called the quatern, which is the exact same thing. So like, one of stanza one becomes line two of stanza two, line three of stanza three, and so on. And what seemed to be different about this viator was that you can have any number of stanzas, and then that same line just keeps moving. So if you want like 17 stanzas, that line becomes line 17 of the 17th stanza. Oh, wow. Um, so that seemed to be the difference. And so I was a little um, curious why, why they were saying this Robin Skelton invented it, um, unless she just you know came up with the idea of having only three lines, three stanzas or whatever. Um, I think it's shorter. Yeah. Uh, you know what I like to do? I, I like to challenge myself. I haven't been able to do this, but maybe if I get the inspiration to read over it. I remember one of my favorites was the, the one of the ancient mariner. Oh yeah. And, I, and Edgar Allan Poe. So I would like to use them as some inspiration, but I don't know if I can. You know, the one of the ancient mariner was was so. It was it just spoke volumes. I don't know if I can, can create anything of that, with that depth and that length, but mm -hmm. but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, that's um, one of the things that I like about this poem or that struck me is I think today we have this very, you know, focus on positive thinking and put the best face on it, you know, and you don't have a funeral, you have a celebration of life and, you know, you shouldn't cry. And, and this poem takes the opposite. It says, <laughs> let it all out there. You know, if you're in, if you're in despair, sing a song of despair and other people are going to hear you um why do you think it's important that sometimes maybe we really need to sing a song of despair because i think we need to be honest about our feelings and i think we need we can teach your song and poetry i learned a lot through life about life through literature not just from you know the modern american media but i like print and so i think it's it's the songs teach you know before mm -hmm. people can write the the, the communities told the stories in oral traditions, and we still do that today, you know, with our Christian hymns and stuff, mm -hmm. and so it's just important to have, we have all sorts of moods and all types of experiences, and I think that we need to be honest about those experiences, and that they're okay, that it's a part of life, and that we can, you know, teach others, and 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 just connect and bond with them, and, and have them emphasize and feel what we're feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I kind of thought as I read this and was thinking about this idea that everybody is so, um, you know, big on positive thinking and, you know, only speak the good things and so on, which I, I think there's, um, 
a good aspect to that too. I just think it can maybe be, we need balance. You know, same thing I was saying about uh, form versus free form. I think we just need balance between the two. Um, but it kind of reminded me of what we talk about, this idea that some people, maybe many people, have this kind of depression thing going on because they're looking at everybody on social media and everybody on Facebook is only putting the good stuff out there. And so everybody else is like, oh my gosh, everybody's life is wonderful. You know, how come I'm the only one whose life is terrible? Well, because... you know, everybody is editing and putting up the things. Right, right. You everybody know, I'm... is, um, what word am I looking for? Well, everybody's putting it, they're, uh, they're, putting, they're, putting, they're, they're putting a positive skew on things. Right, putting the best foot forward. Their lives are not that perfect. Right, and, and I kind of, I go back and forth like, okay, but on the other hand, you don't want to air dirty laundry on social media. No, so, no, but no, I also no. get, you know, this thing that, you know, maybe nobody ever says, I, I don't know, they just, you know, they want to portray themselves as being wonderful and perfect. Um, I think that I'm not one for perfect. I don't I don't put up a lot of, you know, I, I don't, we don't, my husband and I, we don't put up a lot of comments about mm -hmm. everything going on in the media. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had experience at, just to a side, maybe not, my husband tells me move on, forgive myself, and he doesn't, doesn't look down on me. But I had experience with, with the job and we, where we were working with the children. And my, my director was in charge of class and she made an error. Mm -hmm. The media lambasted us for 21 days and oh put us goodness. down so badly <laughs> yeah, that my yeah. boss couldn't hold her head up. So I try not to post a lot of political comments or something mm -hmm. that's controversial or, or you know, that's going to get me in trouble or get me fired yeah. or censored, yeah. but I, I try and, I'm not perfect, but, but I don't, I don't get down a journey with everything that's going on, you know? <laughs> yeah. I have one last question, um, kind of, well, I mean, it's related to poetry in general. And, you know, you, you had me looking up these various forms, and it got me to thinking about some of the forms I studied a few years ago, um, particularly some of the medieval bardic forms, because my writing is set in the world of medieval Scotland. And so I wanted to read you the rules of... Um, one of them, this is called Shana. Um, it's spelled S-E-A-D-N-A, -E but it's pronounced Shana because it's a Gaelic word. So alternate lines of eight syllables with two syllables ending and six syllables with one syllable ending. So um, you've got, you know, line one has to have eight syllables and the last word has to be two syllables. The next line has to be six syllables, and it ends with a one-syllable word. Right. I mean, these are very specific. Lines two and four rhyme. Line three rhymes with the stressed word before the final word of line four. Uh, two across rhymes with the second couplet. I'd have to go back and read what that even means anymore. And you need alliteration in each line. I mean, I this, this was a medieval... There are other forms that I, I couldn't get the hang up because they were not as simple with all of those rules, the alliteration and the mm -hmm. internal rhyme. So, you know, um, Why there are things I couldn't get the hang up. And like with my, I tried a couple of sonnets and mm -hmm. I wasn't, I know that I can look up the, the words and see and, and pick up the meaning. But mm -hmm. with this, I couldn't get the hang up. And I know that I can look up the, the words and see and, and the definition or syllable counter. But I was kind of concerned that I didn't have that the stress on the meter that I uh -huh. wanted with, the, with, the, with, the, with the every other syllable being stressed. Yeah. I had the, the number of syllables and the number of lines and the couplets and everything at the, at the end. Well, my my question was, you know, we've, we've talked about working in forms and why it does this, but people have been doing this for centuries, you know, making up sometimes very complex rules. Why do you think people are drawn to create all these rules and all these forms? I don't know. You know, there are some of modern American forms too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I see, yeah. Like for one, one I remember that I I don't remember the rules. We can look at, but it's a Nashers point. A what? So Nashers, N A S H E R S, and that's like, you know, that's much later in in time period than than um, you know, than some of the earlier right. centuries. Right. Yeah. But so um. Anyway, that's, I mean, actually, you know, my husband actually created a form just a few weeks ago, which is kind of a neat form, but um, we are ready to go on to beer number three already. All right. Uh, so I have to say, Laura, that last uh, sort of convoluted form that you described, 
it sounds like my kind of poem because as a writer, I love alliteration. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have been told that as a writer, I tend to use too much alliteration. So, <laughs> so um, alliteration in every line, let's bring it. <laughs> bring it on. But wait a second, the last thing I knew you wrote was your beer travel books. Were you using alliteration in those? No, there wasn't much opportunity for alliteration there. <laughs> Although I can come up with opportunity anywhere, really. No, I'm curious. Well, you also write uh, for what, The Growler? You write for The Star Tribune? Star Tribune. Uh, I write a lot less than I used to, but I used to write okay. in a whole lot of venues. Uh, so beer number three is from Bent Paddle Brewing in Duluth, Minnesota. It is called Black Ooh. Ale. Um, it is... Not exactly what I wanted to find, but no breweries make what I wanted to find anymore. Beer styles come and go. Um, and the Black IPA was super popular several years ago, and then since has faded away, and they are really hard to find these days, because, I don't know, nobody wants to drink them anymore, I guess. Um, but this is the closest I could find to a black IPA. It's They call it a, a somewhere between a porter and a stout. I don't know about that, uh, but that's what they say. Uh, it is a black ale, and it's, uh, let's call it an American black ale. It's black ale. It's got uh, some, the, the typical things you would expect from a black ale, the coffee and the dark bitter chocolate. Um, but it's also got these bright kind of citrusy hop notes that give it a little bit of highlight. Uh, I chose this because this is another poem that kind of comes from a dark place, uh, but as opposed to the Song of Despair, this one has this sense of perseverance, of redemption. There's, there's light in there. There's, there's uh, like a, an, a, a, the ability to carry on. Um, so there, there's the positivity in, in the, the place of mental and emotional darkness. So I see the, the dark beer, the dark beer flavors, and that bright hop as kind of expressive of this poem. So cheers. Cheers. Um, they kind of look the same. <laughs> One here. They don't taste the same. No, they don't. That, you might like this one too. I, I do. I think I like the other one better, but I like them in very different ways. So maybe better isn't even the right word. I, I do like this one. So um, I'm going to have a long day of... Uh, <laughs> day drinking. <I'm, laughs> uh, that too, that, that too. I've got a lot of um, just cleaning and organizing. As you know, I'm still in the process of moving in, but we're also actually looking at moving again. So um, I'm going to be repacking <laughs> so a lot of hard oh, physical wow. labor so you know lots of opportunity to drink beer today so yes yeah my, my <laughs> love 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 root beer we we always have root beer for them go ahead with poem number three this is called dancing and I, i'm on sunny point dancing dancing in the midnight air i am free the, da the dance was soon in, just around the bend. My heart feels dismay, was nothing left to say. I twirl in the night, despite all my mind's fright. I listen to the song, just playing along. It is my desire to walk on the tight wire, like an acro acrobat high above a dense mat. So I take a chance to find a new romance. Then in the haunting of the deep nighttime hour, I begin to feel a surge of power. The end. <laughs> the end. Um, so dancing is in the mas, mas, masnavi, get my tongue around that, the masnavi form. And when I dug into that, it's one that was used by Rumi. And it is, I believe it is couplets and typically about love or God. So um, a funny thing happened when you had sent me the poems, for some reason, a masnavi, uh, why can't I say that? A Masnavi poem, <laughs> Masnavi poem was written at the end of poem two, which also oh. had a Viator poem written at the beginning. And I was like, that's interesting. When you read the definitions, <laughs> this poem, you could actually combine forms like that. So I thought I that was, I, I know, I know, because I sent you an email like, is this, because then it dawned on me, I think you mean the Masnavi, 
Will somebody please say that word for me? Masnavi. <laughs> Masnavi. Um, see, I, I have a few beers and I can't say Masnavi anymore. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta stop it Maybe I couldn't say it to begin with. Um, <laughs> So I think I asked this of a poet, I don't know, a few months ago, um, not that long ago, but when you read enough poetry, or for that matter, enough books, watch enough movies, love is like one of these central themes. Why is love such a primary theme, like one of the most explored of poetry, stories, music? Because love makes the world go round. I think that's what everybody seeks, but it's hard to find real love. Mm -hmm. It's hard to find lasting love. And it takes a while to learn how to care for yourself. I think you have to learn how to let a lot of things go. Mm -hmm. And it's not always easy. Sometimes you have to pick up and go to a new land and get a new environment, just like the Bible tells us about mm -hmm. Abraham. And just, um, just kind of be open. Be mm -hmm. open to Others, it's not that easy to face hurt rejection. It's not that easy to look at your flaws and accept yourself. But just we just need to try and remember that everything we've gone through is common to man. Everything we're going through is human. And, you know, it's hard for me sometimes to to accept that because, you know, Dunbar was um, actually an American slave that's very important to me. I enjoyed reading him in high school. And he had a poem that said, or if we, the end of it says, for if we mortals love or if we sing, we count our joys not by what we have, but by what kept us from the perfect thing. So, you know, that whole idea mm -hmm. of paradise lost and the garden of Eden and, and how we were banished from perfection, and how we never be perfect, but, but I mean, Matt and Paul Pilot, perfect enough. Mm -hmm. what, what was his name? John Barr? John Barr, Paul John Barr. Paul John Barr. Dunbar. Paul P U A L D U N B A R. Oh Dunbar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll get that eventually. Um, what I like, what is interesting about this poem is it's this contrast of dancing with fear. What does this poem say to you, or what do you hope that it would say to other people? Well, I'm not a good dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I have to join in with some singing. But um, I'm, I, I uh, much to my dismay, I'm not a good dancer. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, you know, I can shimmy a bit and lift my arms and wave, but I, I'm not anybody that um is a very is a very confident dancer. But you know, just clapping your hands and mm -hmm. hitting the tambourine and stomping your feet and just um getting a little bit of movement in is is good. But I, I'm not a I'm not a dancer. <laughs> you know, um, one one question that I had farther back in one of the other poems, and we always run out of time in each segment, but I wanted to get to this. You also write music, so you have a YouTube channel, and are you writing the music? Is someone else writing the music? No, I have, um, you know, I'm hoping to branch out for, um, I don't know, I'm looking for searching, so maybe if I can get some acceptance from another publisher that uh, that group they didn't want me to mention the name they said just mention my name they okay. don't want me to publicize them okay. or if you you know but um they are an american company okay and american christian christian businessmen and um the publisher of my of my upcoming book is in czechoslovakia okay she asked me I don't know if this is going to happen, but she wanted me to maybe see if I could come up with some Christmas songs. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, um, I guess she's going to be the musician. So I'm kind of looking for something with a different flavor and a more of an more of an upbeat tone and, you know, something that, that that's just a change. Um, the, the band did a great job. They've recorded a couple of hundred songs. They're not as popular song, but they do a good job and they, they, they have to find repertoire songs from mm -hmm. lots of people over okay. 40 years experience. So are, huh? are you actually writing the music or is no, it? I'm just writing the lyrics, but, oh, but okay. they, they put it to music for me, mm -hmm. but, but I own the rights to the, the okay. music. They just kind of oh, nice. it. So, okay. so I'm hoping to get a different flavor and see if I can get some acceptance elsewhere, but they did well enough. I'm pleased that they that they were able to read me and, 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 and collaborate with me. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, what, what do you have, about half a dozen 
songs up on your YouTube channel, or is it more than that? I have about eight. Okay. Um, I have three more that I came up with this year. They're not up yet. Um, and like I said, I'm hoping to work on those Christmas songs. So if, if God blesses, I hope I'll ha I could I would like a few more. I I would like the inspiration for maybe a few more. I don't know if that's going to come mm -hmm. to pass. If that'll be feasible or or accepted by anybody, but. But we'll see. Yeah, well, um, it's you're off to a great start, and it's really neat to set poetry to music like that. I, like I said, I've done some of that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to what I was talking about at the very beginning about finding this book in this antique store. And as we were following, because, you know, <laughs> we were flying at tremendous speeds down some massive roller coasters of roads in Missouri, and I had to do something to not look at what was happening in front of me, um, also because it was really interesting. Um, so I was on the internet while we were driving looking up, like uh, the author of this book of sermons that I was holding that was 200 years old, and it is a massive, thick book, and I wish I'd brought it, um, I meant to bring it to hold up in front of the camera. Um, it's in really good shape, but I thought, you know, somebody who wrote this massive book of sermons, surely you can find them on the internet. This book must be reprinted or something. And um, nope, not a single thing about him anywhere on the internet. I looked up the publisher, you know, they were publishing 200 years ago. Obviously it was a thriving business to have published a book like this. They're nowhere to be seen. There was a clipping in there about a man, what was his name, Stanley Barnett, and somebody had put this little clipping inside this book, and Stanley Barnett apparently was one of the best-known radio announcers in America in the 1930s. You can find almost nothing about him on the internet. I found one little note about him in a, um, the county historical page on Facebook. I can't find anything else. And so I was thinking, you know, this really is telling that these are people who were big names. They were very accomplished in their time. Uh -huh. What, where do you hope your work is in the 100 years or 200? And what impact do you hope? Because I'm so excited to dig into this book and get it translated, you know, because it's, it's disappeared. It's, I might have the last copy of it. Where do you hope your work would be and what impact do you hope it would have on people in 100 or 200 years? Well, if you could help me with this, or if you have any ideas, I've been searching, seeking. I don't need to be vain, but my mm -hmm. dream was to be, is to be, I know it's great to be online, and that, that might be enough, but my dream is to be, in, and for the children to remain being a textbook. I'm sorry, say I that again? Know, my dream is to be not just online, but to be in a textbook for the children. So I do have some ideas of, of, of of um, how that might happen. I don't know whether I have to be honored, chosen by somebody else after mm -hmm. my passing or right. what, but I, you know, I just, I guess it's enough to be online with Frost and everything right. that I read. Well, I think it's, that's, that's a good question. And one of our former guests was Timothy Young, and he was also the featured poet in uh, the last Gabriel's Horn anthology, which you were in, uh, Startled by Nature, I think was the second one. And I believe he has had his poetry written in or published in some textbooks. And hopefully, you know, <laughs> Timothy, if you're listening and I got it wrong, I apologize. But, but I'm pretty sure he said that some of his poetry is in textbooks. And when I asked him how, he said, you know, in a way, it's hard work that you just keep putting it out and putting it out and putting it out. But he said the other thing is when you put out enough, eventually somebody sees it and picks it up. And so it's kind of a combination of dumb luck and hard work, you know, right. that you just put out enough and hopefully it starts coming to the right attention. Or, you know, I suppose you could solicit too and contact, you know, I, I actually have a friend in, I think, Nebraska who writes textbooks, but he's in sociology, not, not English. Okay. Or, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that sounds like the advice. The only thing is, you know, I get a lot of leads from good people like you guys. But I, but the textbook market is not something that I've, that I, that I've been able to research. I, mm -hmm. I, I can't figure out what to do with that. You know, most of what I see are literary magazines. I get a lot of leads for literary magazines, uh -huh. and I get a lot of rejections. And <laughs> That's the life of a writer. I have to, you know, not everybody has the same focus, and not everybody's going to want, you know, what I'm writing about. Right. But, mm -hmm. but, but they're polite about it, and I just take it in stride and just keep. 
just keep putting it out there. But I haven't seen any, you know, I don't know how to to enter into the, the textbook market. Yeah, and you know, sadly, I think sometimes it's who you know too. So I think it's all three of those things. But that's well. Speaking of textbooks, you know, and where's the textbook going to be in a hundred years? I found a very, very old textbook too in that antique shop. But that's a story for a different day. Um, I may have the last copy of that textbook too, because I imagine most of us. Um, actually, it's it's um, it's a textbook from Germany, 1934. So I imagine a lot of those were destroyed. So to me, it's a fascinating piece of history. Like, how did they brainwash those kids? You know, and textbooks affect kids. So um, we are at the end of not our rope, but our time. So, uh, Michael, do you have any upcoming events? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Not public events anyway. I've got like 36 for 36. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, the only thing I really have going on, you know, that would be of interest to our 48.08 million listeners is that Gabriel's Horn is accepting submissions for 2021's anthology, which is Startled by Love. And you can find the information, submission information on the Gabriel Swarm site, which is cleverly named GabrielSwarmPress.com. Um, I don't know how I thought that one up. <laughs> uh, what, what are your links, Michael? Uh, I am at aperfectfind.net and aperfectfind on the various socials, although I haven't done anything on the various socials in a really long time. Um, we are at booksandbrews.net. We are at Book and Brews on Instagram and Books and Brews with Laura Bosica and Michael Agnew on Facebook. And Laura, where are you? Um, I'm at lauravosica.com and I believe if you put in bluebellschronicles.com, that probably also takes you there. Um, let me see. I, I'm really not doing anything on Twitter. I'm really not doing anything on Instagram. I'm, I'm really not doing anything except packing and unpacking all the time. Um, and Eugenia, where can people find you? You can Google my name, Eugenia Fain. I'm on Amazon. I am on allpoetry.com. And just, you know, just look me up. Just Google my name. Yep. And I'd appreciate if, you know, somebody would be kind enough to give me an Amazon review. And, um, or leave a comment on old poetry. I always love hearing and receiving mm -hmm. from comments from people all around the world. And Thank I you. believe your handle at um, all poetry is at my wife three hundred four. That's correct. Okay, so. Uh, who do we have next week or next month? Whatever, whatever period of time I mean, we do this. Yeah. Right. The way we do this, it could be next week. Um, so coming next month, we have another poet, Ernie Brill, who actually was also in the Startled by Nature anthology. Ernie writes fiction and poetry. His breakthrough collection about black and white hospital workers was optioned and adapted by Ruby D and Aussie Davis for their PBS series with Ruby and Aussie. Miss D performed to critical acclaim. Mr. Brill obtained his BA and MA in English from San Francisco State University and was active in the 1968 to 69 historic student strike against racism that established the first school of ethnic studies in the world. He has published fiction and poetry widely. Um, so some of the places are River Sticks, Other Voices, Word Peace, Oxford University Press, Prentice Hall, Ontario. His favorite writers include Virginia Woolf. I am going to completely mangle these names. I'm afraid Mahud Darwish, Hyasun Kim, and Richard Wright. I'm especially concerned about my pronunciation of the last one. Do you think I got it? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard, if I messed that up. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody out there for tuning in this. And I want to thank you, Eugenia, for joining us. Uh, it's been a lovely conversation. Uh, this has been Books and Brews, episode number 26. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>